Coach here, doing a bit of a different segment this time. I'm going to talk about my recent explorations, investigations into Bitcoin, something you may have heard about. And I'm going to try to keep it layman so that uh, we're not getting too technical, although it's a very technical subject. I'm going to try to remove all of the uh, bad press, hype, uh, stigmas that are being attached to it with agendas. So let's start off the top. Everyone is thinking of Bitcoin as a currency. And we're used to thinking of money as a currency. And so right away we're into troubles because it's so different, it's hard to compare the two. They're called all these types of coins that are being produced now digitally. They are called cryptocurrencies. And this is because they actually come from the field of cryptology which is used how spies, you know, cloak and dagger stuff, secret services, agencies, transmit messages around without trust being a factor and without anyone being able to decrypt and intercept their messages if they don't want them to. That technology, that mathematical wizardry that allowed them to encrypt messages that can only be decrypted by the uh, intended recipient has evolved into this system of transferring money or units or honestly you could transfer books, you could transfer music, you could transfer pictures, you could transfer anything that can be converted into numbers. And since a computer already has everything that it in it is in it stored as a number, it can do math with that and do the algorithms and the math that encrypts and decrypts, in this case, a financial transaction. So we're going to take this analogy, this explanation from the realm of money, and let's leave it in the realm of espionage. Let's imagine, and hopefully when this gets uh, remastered, I will actually have some um, graphics blue screened in behind me to help you out. So if you're having trouble following this, uh, tune in again once the official version is launched, not the live to air. So imagine that there is a network of spies. There are thousands of spies and you as one spy want to send a message to another spy. You take your spy ID, the message, and the spy's ID that you want to send it to, you work them through a mathematical formula that encrypts this message. No one can decrypt that message except the spy that it's intended for, who's the only one who knows his her or her personal number. However, how do you get the message to them? You just hand it off into the spy network. And every spy, every other spy they meet, they give them a copy of this message. It can spread naturally through the spy network. Every person who receives that message attempts to decrypt it with their code. If it doesn't work, they know the message was not for them. What they do is they take their number, they add it to the end of that message, encrypt it again, and pass it on to whatever other spies they happen to meet. Each of those spies will receive, repeat the process. They will try to decrypt the message with their number. If it doesn't work, they'll know that message was not intended for them. They add their number on, they encrypt it again, and they add it through. That way, the message can be followed through the network to whoever and whatever agents have handled it. And yet it can't be opened and read until it gets to the actual agent who was the intended recipient of that message. That system works well as far as just getting the message going, um, delivered. It cannot be intercepted. It cannot be messed with. If you change any character in that message whatsoever, down to like a period on a sentence, one pixel in a picture, a note in a song. When you decrypt it, it will not work correctly. The whole message will be scrapped. You cannot tamper with the message itself due to the encryption techniques. They cannot be reverse decrypted to figure out what the original message was or who the original sender was. And also, you can track by adding the number of each spy where it actually was handled, who has handed this off. Excellent system. 
about the only problem that can creep into this system is a matter of timing. Because you have no way to know what path your message took for the spy, a double agent, a nefarious spy with an agenda, could send you two messages. Say the one message said, don't go back to the safe house tonight, it's been compromised. And the other message said, get back to the safe house immediately, you are in danger. And those two messages were sent out simultaneously, which is the real message? And because the spy network is random, the, the hand, handoffs can be random, the path that the message takes can be random, you don't know which message would get there first. And here's how they handle that problem. Rather than a timestamp, what they do is they have every spy in the network working on a problem. And when the spy solves his particular problem, he takes his body of messages and everyone he's handed off to, and he writes that down into what's called a block. And that block becomes the official sequence of this happened now. And the next spy that solves their problem takes all the messages they've handed off and they write their block and that goes in sequence behind the next block. So you have these blocks of history of messages stored by different spies randomly throughout the network that can all be connected together in sequence and yet no one spy can control those blocks. And that means no lie can be perpetrated within the blocks, because if any of them lied, their block wouldn't match up with the next block, the data wouldn't flow, the mathematical formulas would not add up, and you have obviously a break in communication, that message is thrown out, and you never manage to get your message or your lie through. So how do you make sure that the same spy isn't always the spy that writes the block? Let's say that the task that the spies have to do, all the spies are solving a crossword. And it's a special crossword puzzle. All the fields are blank, and your job is to figure out what words you can put in all the fields in this crossword puzzle and complete a crossword puzzle. The first spy who manages to complete their crossword puzzle now gets to write the block. However, the fastest, most intelligent, wordy spy is going to be the one who consistently gets the crossword puzzle done first. He'll be writing all the blocks. He could tell a lie knowing that he's going to be writing all the blocks and he'll have the uh, ability to tamper with them. To get around that, every crossword puzzle gets one random word thrown into the middle of it. And now you have to solve the puzzle with this random word in it. This element of chance, some of the puzzles are now going to be completely unsolvable. Some of them are going to be easy to solve, and some of them will just be very hard to solve. This takes the skill and the speed of computing factor out of the equation. This random element, this uh, random number in the case of the computers, means that the element of chance and luck has been introduced. There's still a problem with this system, though. While you can't guarantee that one spy will always now complete the crossword first, Let's say that spy goes out and starts enlisting other spies to join his agenda as a double agent. And he can count on half the spies in the network to tell him what words they got randomly that didn't work or how they couldn't solve it. If they're all working together on solving the same puzzle, the odds just got very good that that spy will be the one that gets to write the block consistently because of the collab the collaboration of the other evil, nefarious spies. That is the only weakness they can foresee in this. You can increase your odds of being able to write the blocks and tell a lie that has sent two messages at once in the case of a currency. That would be to spend your money twice or the double spend. If you are absolutely sure that you are going to write all the blocks in the future and you determine to tell a lie at the outset of a sequence, mathematically the odds against this, the computing power it would take, the cooperation within the network of computers to pull this off are mind-boggling. However, that is the one little weakness that has been detected in this system that could be employed, and that's what 
everyone talks about as the weakness of Bitcoin. So you decide for yourself if that's a deal breaker. I will say, when you look at how many credit cards are stolen, the fact that it takes days for a bank to convert for, to confirm a money transfer within your own town, let alone overseas, the system we have now is no more secure. In fact, let's look at a few of the other complaints that are constantly leveled against Bitcoin and see how legitimate they are. First of all, realize most of the people talking about Bitcoin are either news agencies who love a scandal and will look for dirt on anything because dirt sells, competing coins who uh, would like to defame and criticize Bitcoin and say they're doing a better job to uh, make their own light shine a little brighter, and geeks and nerds and people who are really, really good at math and computers, but not necessarily the best at explaining things, who also sometimes get their own understandings mixed in, and then the rumor mill that just pumps out all kinds of stuff. You have to be aware that this is most of the information we're getting on Bitcoin now. Take it with a grain of salt and realize that most of the charges leveled against it are overblown. Bitcoin is the preferred currency of criminals. The preferred currency of criminals is cash. The US dollars in paper form can buy you anything anywhere in any city in just about the entire world. Try to pass off Bitcoin to a local criminal and you will find out just how much of a currency of crime it really is. It doesn't compare at all. Transparency, that you can deal with Bitcoin completely anonymously. How are they finding all the Silk Road guys to arrest? It's because Bitcoin leaves that trail permanently. There are no actual ledger books in our spy scenario. The books are completely distributed randomly throughout the entire network and chosen by the um, crossword process, who gets to write it down? So that shows that there's a constant record of every transaction in Bitcoin. That's how they're catching these guys. So it's not, there are ways you can really go out, 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 out of your way to have somewhat anonymous transactions where they can see the transaction happen. You don't know who made it. That's about the best you can do. And maybe that is better than the money transfer system but it's still not a totally anonymous criminal network. And when we go through the other complaints, uh, Mt. Gox is the world's premier exchange well, that is going under and having problems. For a brief time in the early days of uh, Bitcoin, it was. It's not anymore. And never confuse the exchanges who are trading Bitcoin for other coins and for money, much like a unofficial stock market. Never confuse those exchanges, which are small private businesses, usually run by very innovative and uh, headstrong entrepreneurs. Don't confuse them with the infrastructure of Bitcoin themselves. It's totally separate units. That's like saying that Goldman and Sachs or some other huge uh, stockbroker can totally dictate the spirit, the safeness of the US dollar. It just doesn't work that way. And that's the same with Bitcoin. So I hope that helped clear things up a little bit, what Bitcoin is, what Bitcoin isn't. It's not actually a currency. It's a way to exchange information that is being eyeballed, used, and has grown into a quasi-currency throughout the world, safer than the systems we're using far cheaper than the systems we're using. And I will say, in the US, Canada, Europe, though all that you're really seeing there for as a transferal medium is a small price savings from the banking fees. But when you go to countries with really oppressive regimes running them, um, or unsettled regimes, coups going on, the currency comes and goes all the time, or the government and the banking system delays your payments to your business for months at a time, which happens in countries like Russia and China, they are leaping on Bitcoin because it is a, such a better system for them to be able to transfer money reliably, safely, in a denomination that uh, they can trust that isn't controlled by their governments or their banking system. 
So while we are looking at it as a novelty and as a speculative venture, it's new lifeblood for a lot of countries in this world. And if we don't push it, embrace it, and get it right away, you can bet they are. And uh, it's here to stay for a while. It might not wind up being the cryptocurrency in the end. Someone may actually come out with one that is better. But this technology of using cryptography to pass on messages and using that for currency is here to stay. And it's going to show up in all kinds of ways all over the world. Hundreds of billions of dollars of investment are going into businesses that use this technology. So you can hold out as long as you want, watch it from the sidelines, but don't be surprised at all if, uh, just like MP3s for music and uh, torrent systems for movies, other the internet itself with information, if this doesn't move in and become a constant feature of your life in the digital connected age. And that's what I'll say about that today. Thank you very much.